Hey, welcome to the Road and Morale podcast. So do you ever feel like screaming out in the office on Zoom or outside the school gates? For the love of God, come on, really? Then if this is you and you're looking for an honest, fun and frank podcast on life and business, then sit back and listen to me, Rona Morel. I'll be bringing great people on the show to talk, share and debate their life experiences and business challenges. Keeping the show unpolished, but in a fun and unique British style. With sarcasm, tenacity, maybe a few swear words or tears. This podcast keeps it real, honest, raw and removes the bullshit in the only way I know how. Through authenticity and getting shit done. Think of it less like the Housewives of New York or TOWIE with the lipo and drama and more like the house lives of the real world. I hope you'll take something away to be better informed, laugh, smile or maybe even finally get in the confidence to shout, come on really. So enjoy. Hi, Anders. Welcome to the Rona Morel podcast. How are you today? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. I'm, I, I happen to be in Budapest today for a scientific meeting. It's a beautiful city, very beautiful. Oh, I've, I've never had the pleasure of going, actually. Um, but for the listeners, I am genuinely excited to have Anders Wiegmann with me today. And I am going to read off a little bit of his bio because it's certainly incredible and then come on to why we're we're having this conversation um, all around the book Earth for All. So Anders is an, an opinion maker and an author. He's the honorary president of the Club of Rome and the chair of the governing body of Climate CIC, which is the largest public private partnership on innovation for all low carbon solutions in the EU. He's also a member of the International Resource Panel, and during 2015-16, he chaired the Swedish Cross-Party Committee on on Environmental Objectives. So Anders has also served as a member of the European Parliament, as Assistant Secretary General on the United Nations Policy Director. He has a plethora of economic, political knowledge and has written various books, um, co-authored, over the years but the reason why we're here today is actually one of the latest in 2022 this book um, earth for all was uh, published and anders was actually the uh, the chair for all of the experts that were inputting into this book and also contributing to it and this is why we're here today because this book actually addresses the kind of the follow-up from 50 years ago when the first limits to growth by the Club of Rome was written. So very much welcome you today and thank you for your time, Anders. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Ah, fantastic. So listen, I'd love to jump straight in to, to let the listeners know what really kind of excited me about this book. So as obviously somebody working in this space and studying and reading and, you know, misinformation and socials etc I came across this book through my studies at Cambridge and I thought okay this is called a survival guide for humanity what what could this mean and I'm very interested in the fourth industrial revolution as well and technology and I think what totally blew my mind about this book was actually the simplistic policy solutions that you're recommending so you've worked on two models which if correct me if I'm wrong is a too little too late model or a giant leap in terms of a a fast transition and essentially how to reboot our kind of global economic system. And what I'd love you to talk to us about is really the five main policies. Um, Of course, there are sub policies, but the five main policies that you've recommended uh, and why. And I guess we'll we'll go off in different tangents, but over to you, Anders. I I just desperately want to hear more. Mm. Well, you know, this book, came about because, as you rightly said, uh, 50 years have passed since the limits to growth, which was one of the first reports or books that really addressed the whole uh, and looked into the future and tried to understand uh, how can we make sure that uh, we uh, offer decent livelihoods to the majority or the vast majority of the population, and at the same time, 
don't overuse the planet's resources uh, and pollute the planet. So, so that was really uh, what the Limits to Growth was all about. And it basically said that um, if we continue to, to grow the economy as we have had, as we had done then since the Second World War, uh, we would run into problem uh, because of a combination of pollution uh, and possible resource depletion as a consequence of populations growing and economies growing, mm -hmm. uh, that there are sort of limits. Uh, that report was dismissed by politicians. They didn't want to hear that message. It right. was dismissed by leading economists. They basically said, oh, you haven't thought about innovation. We humans, we are so smart. We will innovate ourselves out of any problem. And if there is scarcity of something, well, we have the price mechanism, prices will go up and we will substitute. What they didn't pay attention to or didn't uh, sort of neglected was, of course, that you cannot substitute for ecosystem services and biodiversity. Yeah. Uh, and you cannot substitute for a stable climate. Uh, however much money you throw on the glaciers in Greenland, uh, you, you, you cannot stop the melting. So, so I think conventional economists ha had a problem and has a problem. Uh, yeah. They have not really included in their models the delicate balance between the economy and nature. So now, 50 years later, we decided to take stock of what has happened um, and where are we? Uh, and uh, how does it look for the future? Um, and first of all, we concluded that more or less what was predicted or projected in limits to growth in the basic scenario uh, is happening. We are, we are overusing the planet. Yeah. Uh, we have crossed so far six out of nine so-called planetary boundaries. Yeah. Um, and I think most people now agree that, that climate is destabilizing. It's getting warmer and warmer with a lot of consequences. Uh, but what is even worse, uh, this is happening in a situation where still four out of eight billion people on the planet are dirt poor. Yes. So many people live still in poverty. I mean, it would have been easy to, to address this issue if all of us on the planet had decent living standards. Then we could start, you know, discussing among ourselves, what do we do? But now we have a situation where at least 4 billion people have to be lifted out of poverty. Yes. Uh, uh, but they cannot be lifted out of poverty with the kind of policies that we have pursued, because okay. then this little planet would, uh, would not, would not function as, as we wanted to function. Uh, we would drown in our own waste materials and residue products, etc. And, and resources would be scarce in many areas, not to speak about climate instability. So, so that, that's really, that's really the situation. Yeah. And then we asked ourselves, now looking into the future, are there recipes, are there policies that could take us to a better place? Uh, and we came to the conclusion that we need transformation. We don't need incrementalism. We need transformation. We need to rethink how we organize ourselves. Okay. And, we, and we ended up with five major transformations. And most people would expect the Club of Rome because we have been known primarily for our concern for the environment, etc., that we would start with sort of the green issues. No, we don't. We start with the social issues. Yeah. Simply because, simply because we, we, first of all, we cannot neglect uh, that, that the world today is, is very unjust. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a, a, a huge equity problem. Uh, and secondly, we have a lot of inequalities also within countries. Uh, and we don't think that we can deal deal with the long-term environmental and climate-related issues unless we deal with the social issues that are here now. We cannot, right. we cannot motivate poor people or people who feel 
left behind in our own societies, whether we live in Sweden or in the UK or in the US, uh, we cannot we cannot include them and, and get them to accept an agenda which deals with, with the longer term issues unless we uh, we take care of, of their own standard of living and their and 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 the, and the equity issues that, that that are obvious today. So that's why we the first transformation is really to address poverty uh, heads yeah. on uh, and to really understand that we need to channel a lot of resources to assist low-income countries to uh, get to a better place. And I think um, for some of the colonial powers, like the UK, like France, like Portugal, like the Netherlands, <laughs> to name a few examples, like Germany, they should go back in time and, and look at what they've been doing for a couple of hundred years. They have extracted wealth from all these low-income countries, enormous amounts of wealth. And now it's payback time. It's payback time. So uh, the first is really to, to make possible not only a, a, a transformation in terms of moving from poverty to a better standard of living, but also do it uh, by greening their economies. And we have to invest massively, for instance, in, in, in clean energy. We have to invest massively in, um, in a more effective uh, agricultural farming system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the first. The second transformation is to address inequality within our countries by taxing the rich, yeah. Um, and and I, I, I mean, people don't like taxes, but uh, there, there are such enormous differences in standard of living. Yeah. And if we lo start looking at um, footprints, what we, whether we talk about carbon footprints or material yeah. footprints, the 1% or the 5% at the top of the income ladder globally, and some of them, of course, live in India or in China, so they don't all live yes. in in Western countries, but their footprints are 10 times, 15 times, 20 times, 50 times larger than the poorest ones. Yeah. So, I mean, we need to do something about this and, and we can't just continue to uh, an increase material consumption among some 10% of the population where yeah. the rest, <laughs> where the rest is, is, is still standing still or lagging behind. We introduce one new idea here, which I think is very interesting. We, we talk about the universal basic dividend. Yes. And the idea is that uh, to use the commons, whether we talk about mining, forests, <coughs> fossil fuels or whatever, um, resources that we extract from Mother Earth, or we talk about the internet, or we talk about financial structures. Companies who earn a lot of revenue by using these com commons yeah. should contribute uh, to, to the common good. And um, uh, because they are benefiting from commons that yeah. to, to a large extent belong to us all. Why should you as a mining company take all the revenues from extracting whatever it is, copper, or yeah. if, if you are an oil company, oil or gas? Uh, it's not fair. Um, it's not something that, that you have invented alone. It's, it's something that, that was there and for you to, 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 uh, to use. So, so this universal basic dividend uh, would be a way of, um, distributing some of the uh, revenues to ev every citizen. Um, yeah. Um, and some people, when they hear about this, oh, they, this is communist. No, it's not communism. It's, it's a very practical way of, of uh, sharing uh, revenues from the commons. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, uh, it is being practiced uh, already today 
uh, it was a Republican governor in the state of Alaska who some years ago introduced this idea. <coughs> and last year, every Alaskan citizen benefited from more than $3,000 yeah. as a dividend. Uh, for the rich, it didn't mean much, but for ordinary people, it meant a lot. And you can just imagine if something like that would be uh, applicable all over the world, in particular in 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 in, uh, in low income countries. So so uh, we think this is an interesting idea. Uh, yeah. So Can it's I a combination of taxes and and this kind of fee. And I just ask on that because when, when I read that in the book, I thought, oh, you know, this is genius idea and actually it seems to have worked well were there any knock-on impacts that you were aware of from those companies then suddenly not investing in technology or not you know leaving the country all of those sorts of things that on a media we would hear that certainly in the uk or oh, they'll stop investing or they'll leave the country if we don't if, if we put these sorts of things on them did did that happen i don't think no uh, it's it, i don't think it has been practiced uh anywhere else but i haven't heard of any any such uh, uh reactions or responses uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to the financial system we have talked for quite some time about the so-called tobin tax that would be a tax on financial transactions that would be very right. low but given that financial transactions are many it it would add up uh it it was never um, it was never operationalized, unfortunately, uh, but I think it would mean a lot. We have also been talking about the bit tax, uh, right. so applying the same same kind of logic uh, on the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. Look at the big tech companies; they earn billions and billions and billions of dollars. Of course, they could pay a small dividend uh, um, to sort of balance the situation better. So I. I I think this is a, this is an attractive idea. I don't mm. think it's 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 neither a right wing or a left wing idea. It's 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 quite a balanced thing. It's quite um, it's quite pragmatic. I suppose as you know, as some, like even for myself, all the data that I create, if you like, is making some of these companies a lot of money, and they use it in development of you know AI. They use it in terms of marketing. They earn affiliate revenues. All of these sorts of things, and so. Suddenly, you know, I know that there are tech companies out there breaking into the market that protect your data. You know, you own your data, you own it. So, yeah, I, I do think that a small percentage of something that is so vastly used um, in terms of data, for example, seems a fair representation of what money they're making versus the fact that it's actually content generated by millions of everyday people. No, absolutely. Um, and and it's it's somehow a mystery to me that still 15, 20 years after <laughs> the internet was introduced, um, and in the beginning we didn't we didn't really understand what was happening, and we didn't understand that companies made use of our data in the way mm. they they have been. Uh, I mean, advertising today is based totally on on on, on analysis of what 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 we uh, what we favor as consumers etc um and it's it's sometimes it's rather rather scary I, I i have experienced i've been sitting in my living room talking to to my family and we talked about something and then half an hour later there is some kind of advertisement yeah surfacing uh, uh on my laptop about exactly what we discussed so so i mean the the, the Something is going on here that is quite quite dramatic, and and uh, I think it would be fair to to um, to compensate every yes. citizen one way okay. or the other. So so that's uh, that. Those are the two major social socially uh, directed or inclined uh, transformations. The third one is to empower women. Uh, yeah. to give women their right place in society. Um, and uh, I, I don't think I need to elaborate on that. Uh, it's, a, it's a question of, of justice, but it's also a question of uh, 
I think making development uh, more balanced. Um, yeah. I have experienced myself over the years uh, when I've been leading organizations uh, in the executive committee. If you are only men, the discussions are uh, rather narrow-minded. If you bring in women, it's it's a totally different yeah. picture. So there's actually there's there's a part of the book that I'd love to read out here that I I I, I made a note and put amen, <laughs> but it says. We must also recognise that unpaid workers, largely, but not only women, provide priceless services to economies and society, enhancing social cohesion. How can this transformative moment be used not only to acknowledge their contributions to society, but to protect them, reward them and empower them? We'd like to introduce the idea of a universal basic dividend. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's yeah. Th th there is a link between those two, of course, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the, 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 this thing of of empowering women, uh, of course, has many facets. Um, um, and uh, we talk about pensions for women. We talk about uh, um, the promotion of women in different uh, professions. Uh, uh, to have a more balanced workplace. Um, yeah. In my country, Sweden, we have an ongoing debate uh, about uh, uh, women, women's role in boardrooms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so there are many, uh, very many aspects of this, and we also look very much at uh, education because yes. edu education for for girls is extremely important. And uh, it's not only Afghanistan who, who uh, discriminates against women. Yeah. Many, many countries do. Uh, and we also know that uh, if a young woman or a young girl uh, is educated, it's much easier for her to withstand and, and uh, not be subject to sexual harassment, etc. So, so uh, and also it's easier, of course, to to get into the job market, uh, and 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 so I mean, the education for for girls is very important. Uh, yeah. We have also a few examples, particularly from India, where in communities where young girls are being educated, uh, fertility rates among them are much lower than among. Yeah girls who are not educated so so there, there there is also a link to population uh we talk about reproductive health of course and and yes. family planning um, family, family planning services is, is very important because uh, population is still increasing that doesn't mean that poor people uh, are the main uh culprits or the main uh, uh uh, behind the main main actors behind climate change, on the contrary, uh, but in the longer term perspective, it's going to be easier to sustain living on this planet yes. if, if we are not too many people. We are already too many people in some parts of the world. Look at a place like Nigeria. I mean, it's 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 yeah, uh, the, 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 and and kind of as we've touched on as well with that, you know, it's. There is a combination of there's a fine line between having that education and knowing your rights from, you know, be that contra contraception, young marriage, etc. But also uh, ability to kind of give the right medical care and attention to, the, yeah. to a lot of global South countries. And I think, um, you know, we often hear in the West, oh, but we've got to keep producing tons of food because we're going to have 11 billion people. And we've got and it's kind of this it's an excuse Um but actually, with the right principles brought in, we wouldn't see such a mass increase in in population. And there are there are many children who are born unwanted. Let's face it. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And we know from uh, different surveys that roughly two hundred million women today want contraceptives. They want help to limit the number of births. But they can't get it, yeah. Either because either because it's not available, or because churches, or uh, um, in some parts of the world, governments uh, object to it. Yeah, there are quite a number of governments who still 
pursue policies where they say we have to be, we have to double our population, we have to triple our population. I mean, well, Tur Turkey is one example. Really, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Well, Erdogan, so Erdogan has <laughs> oh. is, is a is a complex man, huh? So. Yeah, and I think something you've, you've touched on there, both with population and also we, we talked about it earlier and obviously we'll, we'll come on to the other two two main pillars um is obviously growth now i read a um a really great book uh the other day less less is more mm -hmm. and it was the first time i really addressed what does degrowth mean um because actually if i as a sustainability consultant or you know people who's working with boards if i walked into a boardroom tomorrow and said right I'd now like you to see you, you transition a degrowth strategy. I'd like you to come away from anything to do with fossil fuels, plastics. I'd probably be kicked out quite quickly. But it's how do we best promote this within the boardrooms around strategies of degrowth? Because there isn't a business out there that is not looking at growing. No. And, and, and of course, this is... This is which book is this? Less is more. There, there have been. Who's who's written it? Jason, uh, is it Hickel? Hickel, or, yeah, Hickel. Yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. Because there is another one also uh, written by um, by an American. But okay, um, I I have great respect for Hickel um, and uh, the degrowth proponents, uh, but I think it's a very difficult strategy to. Uh, pursue and to uh, have mm. people uh, accept. Yes. Because if you are, I mean, let's start with a small company, a startup. If it doesn't grow, it will, uh, it will fail. Um, and this is the case for the majority of businesses that um, they, they cannot start to, to, to reduce throughput or reduce um, revenue. Um, maybe they can have a steady state situation, uh, but we really don't know how to organize that. Yes. So, so I think uh, what, what we are trying to advocate in the book and what some of my colleagues in the Club of Room are advocating, like Kate Travert, is not to concentrate primarily on growth uh, as uh, 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 as an indicator, yeah. rather concentrate on well-being indicators uh, and be more agnostic about growth. Focus on 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 well-being, of like you know, health, decent jobs, clean environment, yeah. etc. Uh, and if those are your goals um, and you meet them. Well, then, then it's okay, and then if you grow a bit, uh, well, be it. But uh, it's this being said uh, to make this happen, you need, of course, to use resources in a much more effective way. By the yes. way, in my opinion, we should have a, had a sixth transformation, which dealt with materials. Okay. Because uh, and now we now we talk about it more as a cross-cutting issues, but uh, but but materials are so important, not only energy, because material use are really the the thing that drives the economy forward. Yes, um, and we have linear production models. Uh, we use most materials only once, then we discard them. And some of it is recycled, but the design is often such that you cannot do much with the recycled content. So it's being burned or thrown away anyhow. So, so I mean, the, the way we use materials is very wasteful. Um, and uh, we have to organize demand in a much more intelligent way. Uh, I mean, food is, is a given example. We waste Sorry. around one third of all the food produced. In developing countries, it's very often because they, they don't have cooling systems, they don't have uh, logistical systems in place, uh, they don't know how to get the food stuff to the market in time yes. before it starts to rot and etc. But in our part of the world, we threw away food because we are um, we are arrogant. We are uh, we 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 
Yeah, I mean, if a, if 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 a piece of bread is more than two days old, we think, no, no, I don't want to eat that, and we throw it away. Um, I can see with with some of the younger generation, if if the milk in the fridge, if the expire date was yesterday, they they won't drink it. No. And normally you can drink it for another three, four, five, six days. So I mean, we are we are uh, we are. Uh, we we don't value food the, the way we should do, and part of the reason is that it has been relatively inexpensive over the last fifteen to twenty years. Yes, and we have imported cheap food from all over the world uh, at the expense of our own farmers who are subject to um, stricter regulations when it comes to animal welfare and. Yeah environment etc so so i mean the the food business is 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 a major challenge and that's why one of the transformation is food yes and there we embrace uh the concept of regenerative agriculture which i think is very interesting uh, we have some good examples in the us of regenerative agriculture it's coming along in europe yep. in australia and it basically it's uh, it's it's very different from conventional industrial agriculture because you don't disturb the topsoil uh, so yeah. you don't you don't till every time you put a plow in the in the soil you release a lot of carbon you try to uh, develop crops which uh, are perennial so you build build road systems uh, thereby you store more carbon you always cover the soil by uh, some kind of a plant so the soil is always green um, and you talk about fongröda um, in Swedish. What the hell is that in English? Um, uh, I can't help you on that one. <laughs> a, a plant that that sort of uh, that you don't normally uh, grow to eat, rather just to to cover the soil, and protect uh, it, uh, and then and then you harvest it, and you can make biogas or whatever from it. Yes. Uh, so by by this, and then also you rota ro rotate the crops more than what you do in in conventional agriculture. So in such a system, you save a lot of money because, for instance, you don't have to till. So so you save those labor hours, um, and you have much less inputs, both of fertilizers and of uh, so-called uh, plant uh, plant protection materials or pesticides. Uh, you increase the fertility of the soil because you store more carbon, uh, and uh, then you re 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 the, the water retention capacity is increased. You grew more food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a win-win-win, and you store carbon. Uh, so uh, the 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 food production goes from being a carbon source to a carbon sink, which I think is very interesting. What do you, in, in terms of that, it's something that, you know, I'm I'm hugely passionate about. And I've been, you know, working on this natural fertiliser project for some time now. And I absolutely get it. But actually, if I speak to local farmers and, and things like that, it, there's this real, you know, reliance. It is a drug, essentially, on fertilisers because it's this this cycle of we need it because the soil is degraded and, and so on and so forth. And and you know, it's it's going to be a six hundred billion dollar industry by twenty thirty. How do how on earth do we begin to kind of transition outside, of course, governments shifting subsidies towards regenerative agriculture? Well, I think the latter thing is very important because you need carrots and sticks, uh, and the incentives right now are not. Uh, uh, directed towards these kind of, of targets or goals. So that, that has to happen. I, I think you have to reward both forest owners and uh, farmers who store carbon in their soils. That's okay. very important. And uh, if, if you can reward companies who don't pollute, of course you can uh, reward companies or individuals or farmers or foresters who, who who do something positive? If you if you want things, uh, people who don't do something negative, you 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 could do the reverse. I mean, so so I think 
that that's that's very important. Then, of course, you have to have a lot of education and extension services. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I I I do understand that the farming community is probably quite um, hesitant in, towards new ideas and new concepts. Uh, I'm scared. I, I think the fatigue of all the legislations coming in from the changes in the EU, the subsidies that are being taken away, the green transition pressure that's being put on them. Um, yeah, it it exactly. must be, you know, why so many are leaving the profession or, or simply just, well, we've seen it recently with um, our fruit and veg in England, for example. Mm. Of course, we in the UK media have blamed bad weather in Morocco, but we know it's way bigger than that. Yeah, of course. And uh, but I think when when there are sufficient number of farmers uh, in different countries who demonstrate over time that that this works and that we, we in fact we we earn more revenue and we are more happy as farmers uh, yeah. then 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 I think it it will happen. Yeah. But but it's not going to be easy, and uh, the governments must be involved because they must offer loans, cheap loans, for the new kind of equipment that is needed. Um, and uh, uh, and as I said, we need carrots to to really incentivize the right kind of practices. Yeah. Well, actually, I guess putting our money where our mouth is and providing them the, the support to transition back to healthier soils and then looking at the secondary benefits like reduced cancers better health lower cholesterol obesity all these sorts of things so yeah i I guess we could we could talk about that just in its own podcast but i am i am conscious to get on to the 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 fifth of course which is energy uh, it's really about energy and energy systems and uh, well we have been talking about facing fossil fuels out for decades now. Mm. When, I, when I started to be involved in energy policy making in the 1970s, fossil fuels was 85% of the energy mix globally. Last year it was seven, 79%. So that's how far we have come in spite of all these years of, of, of debate and yeah. climate mitigation policies so that shows how far we still have to go and and the right. reason why is of course that this is difficult because we we have benefited enormously from these fossil mm. fuels our living standard would be a pittance of what it is today if we hadn't had these 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 energy sources over the last hundred years yeah uh, there is a frenchman that you should interview called jean marc Jankovici. He he has some very interesting lectures on YouTube where he compares uh, the energy use today with what it was 150 years ago. Yeah. Basically, he's saying that at that time, every human being had his or her own muscles and maybe a draft animal or two. That was it. Uh, And we had a little bit of coal. Today, we have... Each European has, on average, 500 energy slaves working for them. If we would compare, if we would translate oil and coal and gas in different facets into muscle power, it represents 500 fully grown-up people working a- a- around the clock with their yes. their energy and their bodies. Uh, of course, some of the things we couldn't do, we couldn't fly with, with muscle power. But but this, this is an indication of uh, how, how difficult it is to replace all those energy slaves with, with, with something else. And electrification yes. is, is part of the answer. And, and we push a lot for electrification. And we know now that solar and wind, uh, I think also wave, um, I mean, yeah. waves will will uh, matter. I think geothermal will become more important, and of course, we have to uh, build uh, electricity systems that are different, not so centralized, rather more distributed. We need storage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's it's happening, but it must happen four or five times quicker than what is happening today, mm. and it must happen in low-income countries. 
uh, Africa has received about 1.5% of all the money invested in solar and wind over the last 20 years, 1.5%. And in Africa, we have uh, soon to soon we will have one fourth of twenty five percent of the world population living there. So, so we yeah. really need to to do something very radical, and and that's why that's where the the poverty uh, that we want to address in one of yeah. the first transformation and the energy system uh, transformation they, they must go together. And we are talking about special drawing rights from IMF to benefit right. low-income countries uh, so that they can invest in the right type of energy system so, they, they, so that they don't get stuck uh, in the fossil-based system. And this is urgent. This is very urgent. I, and I, I genuinely see that as a fantastic opportunity for the global south to leapfrog our conscious, unconscious mistakes mm -hmm. and build from that starting point, from everything that we now know. And arguably we've known for a long time, but um, I guess that's what excites me about what could and should be happening. I guess what, what gives me fear, and this is one a question that I'd like to ask you, knowing what you know now from the first book 50 years ago to where we are now, um, how do you every day drive hope that the money, the power, globalization are actually going to win over or not win over the majority and kind of transitioning the way we need? I find it really scary. Yeah, no, it is. And, and the main problem is I think that the economic system is so short term in its orientation. Mm -hmm. And the political system is also short term. Yeah. Uh, look, look, look at America. They have elections every second year to the Congress or the House of Representatives. So there is, they are, they are constantly involved in election campaigning. And by the way, too much money involved. Uh, so, so, I, and I remember when I met Al Gore quite, quite some time ago. In, in connection with the film that he had, um, The Unconventional, Unconvenient Truth, he was in Stockholm for that. And we talked about uh, the Congress in the US. And I asked him, what, what, what is your hope for climate legislation? And he said, it won't come. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a Republican or Democratic um, Congress. And at that time, it was George Bush, George W. Bush. Yeah. Because too many of my former colleagues are in the pockets of the fossil-based industry. So they will not agree on something very radical. And we are, I, I think we are still in that situation that, that the short-term business agenda is, is dominating to, to a large yeah. extent. Okay. Uh, and, so and you can see, I mean, look at the UK. They cut their uh, uh, development aid budget from uh, 0.7 to 0.5 a year or two ago. Yeah. My country, Sweden, we have always given 1% of GDP. We, have, we are down now towards 0 0.8. So, so we, are, we are moving in the, in the wrong direction, as a matter of fact. And then the, the war in Ukraine has also, of course, um, made the situation, first of all, it's very tragic and, and sad, uh, but it, it also means that development aid is much more focusing on helping Ukraine for good reasons, but yes. uh, then leaving a lot of the low-income countries behind even more. So, so, I mean, we have a very compli complicated situation. Yeah, sort no, of absolutely. Perfect, sort of a perfect storm. By the way, I, I met a, a scientist from Poland today, and I asked him how many Ukrainians are now staying in Poland. He said, we believe we have more than 3 million Ukrainians living, staying and living in Poland since a year. That's, that's yeah. equivalent to a whole country. Yeah. That's huge. And, and, and I think it's, it's commendable they, the way they, 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 have, yes. they have opened their homes, they have opened their labor market, et cetera. It's, 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 quite, it's quite amazing. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. If I could end maybe on a more positive note with you, Anders, and I, I honestly, 
I need to come and meet you and buy you dinner. And I think I could discuss this for a whole week with you. But what gives you the most hope every day with the rooms that you're in and the people that you're talking uh, talking with? What gives you the most hope for the next 20 to 30 years? Well, it's a difficult question. Um, uh, a year ago, I would have said uh, Greta's generation, the young generation. Um, today, I'm not 100% sure any longer because in the most recent election in Sweden, it was not youngsters supporting Greta who uh, yes. mobilized the, the majority of the votes. It was rather the opposite. So I think that, that there is sort of a backlash right now. Uh, and we see it also in the European Union with regard to the Green Deal, that it's much more difficult to uh, push through the, 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 the necessary um, directives and regulations. So, so right now, I, I, it's difficult to see uh, what, what, what the, <laughs> which are the hopeful signs. Um, I think what we have to do uh, and, and focus on is education. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm not talking now only about the school system. I'm talking about education among ordinary the people. The board level. Yeah. And, and among ordinary people. We have to bring yeah. people along. Uh, and I see in particular in rural areas that people are threatened or feel threatened by the, the Green Deal agenda. Um, and they basically say, uh, oh, it's easy for you living in cities to, 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 to accept higher petrol prices, etc. But we living in the rural areas, we are so dependent on our cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they feel, they feel threatened. And, and so we have to, we have to, organize this transformation in a way that that all people are included and none are le left behind um, and it's a very much a question of perceptions not only about the factual policies yeah so, so that 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 to me would be the, the the lesson number one or or agenda point number one in the coming years education. Okay. Uh, and and I, I'm reminded of the fact that when, when Sweden and Denmark and Norway 100 years ago uh, modernized people's education, organized by teetotalers, by the free churches, by trade unions, etc., etc., was very important. To, yeah. to explain to people what, what democracy was all about, what the modernization of society was all about. And, and now we need, because this transformation is going to be uh, very, very significant, we need, to, we need to do something similar. And, you know, we haven't talked about it, but you also have some exponential technologies that are changing things dramatically. AI. Huge. So, so we, we, we need really to, to meet with people and uh, to help them understand what's going on yeah. and what are the, the right policies for the future. Absolutely. And as, listen, honestly, I, th I think we, we might end up, I might end up doing five podcasts with you, but thank you so, so much. And for anyone out there who wants to learn more about Earth for All. Obviously, this is the book. You can go onto the website. Uh, I picked it up from from Amazon, but actually, I kind I kind of came across it through the, the Cambridge Institute from my from my studies. But it really does kind of address a lot of issues that are quite hard to argue with. Um, and I guess thank you just so much for sharing the 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 content, um, but also for being here today and, and sharing with us what you've been doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, and and if I may. Uh end on a positive note i think the the five transformations that that we uh, present or offer they are very concrete they are doable uh, mm. and they would definitely get us to a much better place and when i when i talk about get us to a much better place i'm not only talking about you and me i'm talking about the vast majority of the people and that's, absolutely that's important absolutely Anders thank you so so much um, it's been an absolute pleasure and I, I do hope to talk to you again soon thank you
Thank you. So that's it. You've made it. The show's over. Thank you for being with us. I hope you've been able to take something away, maybe solve a problem, or just know you're not alone. Here's hoping it made you smile with a few laughs along the way. Please feel free to find me on all social media channels and you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just search the Road and Morale podcast. Have an awesome day and see you next time.